Okay, hello and welcome everybody to the SOAS economics webinar series uh, called uh, Intensifying Inequalities and Limitations of Global Capitalism. My name is Tobias Franz, I'm a lecturer in economics at SOAS. Um, just before we begin uh, with today's webinar that is part of this webinar series that has been organized by the economics department, um, just a quick discla a disclaimer, besides the Zoom meeting, which is recorded, we also are streaming live. So for all of you who have friends and relatives uh, without a Zoom account, please uh, send them this Facebook link that I just shared in the chat um, and uh, share, it, share it widely with everybody. And yeah, so this is some of the uh, disclaimers from the beginning. I'm very excited to introduce and share today's webinar, uh, which is uh, launching the Canadian Journal of Development Studies special issue, which is entitled COVID-19 and crises of capitalism, intensifying inequalities and global responses. The special issue, which is guest edited by colleagues at the SOAS economics department will be freely available for everybody who is attending today. So if you do want access and you have colleagues or friends who also want access to, for in free access to this uh, special issue, please make sure to fill in this Google form that I also now send around, and Sara also send, send, just sent around again, uh, and leave your details there. So Rutledge, the, um, the publisher of the special issue and of the Canadian Journal of Development Studies will be able to send you uh, a copy of that entire special issue with all of the 17 um, contributions in it. Um, so yeah, around 12 or no, 11 months ago when the health the economic, the political and social impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic became increasingly visible and dramatic across the world. Uh, my colleagues, Sara Stevano, uh, Yanis Tafermos, Elisa van Weyenberger and myself, we had the idea of bringing together a collection of essays on the political economy of the pandemic and how it affects uh, different aspects of, of, of our lives and of uh, our economies of political issues, social issues, environmental issues across the world. Um, we then approached Haroon Akram Lodi, who is the editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Development Studies. He's also a SOAS alumnus and a very good friend of the department, who is also very interested in and supportive of our idea. So today is sort of uh, the final day of this process, and we're very ple pleased to also have Haroon here with us today, who will start off uh, about, and talking about the significance of, this special, of the special issue in this current context before Sara um, gives an introduction to the special overview and an overview of the different contributions in the special issue. Because we have, of course, have uh, time limitations and constraints, instead of having presentations of each of the 17 contributions, we will have five presentations from different contribution contributors before we open the floor to everybody attending today for a Q&A session. Uh, please do post your questions in the chat box below um, and, and also don't wait until the end when um, before, before uh, putting your questions to us because we will collect them and bring, it, bring them then to the attention of the presenters at the very end of the sessions. So yeah, this uh, uh, some of the housekeeping rules. Uh, and now without further ado, let me pass it on to Haroon. Um, Haroon is a professor in economics and International Development Studies at Trent University in Petersburg, Canada. And he's also, as I said before, the editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Development Studies. So Haroon, please. Thanks very much, Toby. Um, I'd like to say a few words about the journal and then talk of, just for a couple of minutes about this special issue. So the, uh, as, as uh, you've been told, I'm the editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Development Studies which is the journal of the Canadian Association for the Study of International Development, which is somewhat like the DSA in the UK, uh, with the exception of the, with, with the exceptional fact that we have very few economists as members, uh, making it somewhat different. Uh, the association runs a listserv, is active on social media. We have an annual conference, which is held in the summer uh, every year, have about uh, 800, uh, sorry, 250 uh, members. And for any students uh, that are uh, watching, membership of the association brings with it a free subscription to the journal. And for students, 
I worked out a subscription rate about 10 years ago, which is actually very cheap uh, for students both in the North and in the South. Now, the Canadian Journal of Development Studies is not so well known in the UK, although there are some people that know it uh, reasonably well. It's in its 41st year of publication. And over the course of the last 10 years, when it's been edited by myself and by John Harris, who's very well known to, to many of you, um, there's been a concerted effort to make it far more visible within development studies publications, uh, in particular by stressing its interdisciplinarity. Um, and uh, manifestly refusing to publish monodisciplinary uh, articles. And we've been rewarded by seeing our impact factor rise quite dramatically. One of the, the most notable things about the journal is that we have far and away the largest share of women on the editorial board of any development studies journal. And that's important to us because it reflects the composition of this field. And also we have, uh, apparently, I've been told by people who do the metrics, the largest share of publications from people uh, in the global south of any of the major development studies journals, which of, of course is also uh, important to us. So on the 29th of April last year, I received this email from uh, Elisa, Sarah, uh, Toby and Yanis asking uh, if we'd be interested in a special issue on COVID-19 and the crises of capitalism. And I have to say it was like receiving manna from heaven because I mean, this as an editor, this is exactly what you want to get. You're living through a pandemic. Other journals are producing things very quickly. And then these four exceptional academics say, do you want this from us? Of course I said, yes. Um, but I also thought that the, the Canadian Journal of Development Studies was the ideal home uh, for the journal because of our resolute interdisciplinarity. Um, and I'm very pleased that it's taken really uh, from, from that first email, it's only been 46 weeks until we've reached this point. And the journal itself, as Toby said, will be published as a double issue uh, in the next two weeks. And I do encourage uh, those of you who can't have access to it to sign uh, the Google form that's circulating so that you can get free access uh, to the journal. Now, what can I say then about the place of this particular special issue? Well, you know, we've all had to live through this pandemic. And it's in each of us in many different ways, it has stretched us, stretched us. It's, 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 it's fundamentally transformed our lives. And it's transformed our field, the field of development studies. It is, you know, certainly over the course of my lifetime, a world historical event uh, in terms of thinking about problems, processes of development. And over the course of the last uh, year, we've seen many uh, scholarly journals in the field produce very quickly special issues on COVID-19. But none of those special issues have adopted a political economy analysis in trying to understand the contours and dynamics of this pandemic. And this, I think, is extraordinarily important because I, I'm strongly of the view that only by using a political economy analysis can we get a, full, a fuller understanding of the, of the ramifications of what has transpired to all of us over the course of the past year and the multifaceted way upon which it has impacted all of us individually and collectively. One of the things that I, I say repeatedly is that the COVID-19 crisis has reinforced the global care crisis that we all live through on a daily basis. We've seen how the COVID-19 pandemic reflects a crisis in global agriculture, which is what I work on, but in a whole range of other areas which are very well represented in this special issue, the pandemic is, is, factor, is filtering through and refracting processes of, of change in ways that are unique and which really require uh, an unveiling, a revelation, so that we can better understand how this pandemic is affecting us. So I'm really, really pleased that we've been able to get this uh, to you so quickly. And I really want to congratulate Sarah, Elisa, Toby, and Yanis for the extraordinarily hard work that they've put in, in bringing this together so professionally and so quickly. So thanks very much.
Thank you very much, Avun. Um, and now also to give a bit of uh, context uh, to, and, uh, to, to the special issue and about this political economy analysis and the inter interdisciplinarity that we were very much looking for when we started this process, Sara will give a, a quick overview and presentation of, of, um, of the special issue. So, and Sara, uh, as I said before, is a lecturer in economics at the uh, at our department at SOAS as well. Thank you so much, Tobias, uh, for the introduction and for sharing all of this. And thank you so much to Harun also for the kind words uh, and the warm words towards this special issue. Um, so, I mean, it is clear to all of us that we are living through uh, a dramatic crisis uh, that has been causing uh, much human suffering and death for over a year now. Um, and the magnitude of this crisis, uh, as well as uh, its immediate impacts on everyday life, invoked the urge to make sense somehow and to analyze uh, the profound transformations uh, that have been occurring around us uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so in a way, I think it is uh, this sense of urge that brought uh, Elisa, Tobias, Yannis and myself together around the idea of working towards uh, a collection of contributions uh, on the COVID-19 crisis. And here I would like uh, to briefly uh, extend uh, our thanks uh, on behalf of all of the guest editors, uh, to all of the contributors uh, to the special issue, and uh, to uh, the people at the Canadian Journal of Development Studies uh, who worked with us very effectively to put this together. I mean, clearly, this special issue is here thanks to all of you. And we are very grateful for all of your work on this. And on a more personal note, I also would like to thank my fellow guest editors, uh, because it has been very important to me to have this project to occupy my mind during uh, this challenging year. Um, and indeed, I am uh, tasked with uh, giving you this overview to uh, the special issue. Uh, but uh, this is really the result of true collective work. And uh, uh, this is something that I am very proud of. Um, so thank you, uh, Tobias, Yanis, uh, and Elisa for this. So but let me tell you um, a bit about uh, this special issue. Um, so the collection provides an early analysis, I think we can still call it early, um, of, an, of a phenomenon that is uh, um, evolving. Um, and uh, uh, the contributions focus uh, on key transformations uh, that have occurred uh, in the first uh, six to 12 months uh, from the beginning of uh, the pandemic. Um, in doing so, our issue joins uh, the progressive scholarship that understands uh, this crisis as intrinsic to the workings uh, of 21st century global capitalism. Uh, what our issue adds to this progressive scholarship are two important dimensions uh, that Harun has uh, touched upon a global south lens and an interdisciplinary lens uh, um, uh, with interdisciplinary work from across the social sciences uh, with a specific focus on political economy. So uh, the global south lens is absolutely critical to see how this crisis uh, intervenes on pre-existing fault lines uh, and fragilities. Uh, in fact, it is true that some countries uh, have been more successful at managing the health crisis than others. Uh, in ways uh, that clearly escape uh, those typical divides uh, between uh, poor and rich countries or between uh, the global south uh, and the global north. And indeed, uh, there are important lessons to be learned uh, from the experience uh, of these countries. However, um, we think that such unevenness uh, in responses uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic does not take away from the perpetuation of structural divides uh, between the global south uh, and the global north. Race, class, and gender inequalities are both within countries uh, and cutting across the national boundaries uh, on a global scale have clearly intensified uh, during the COVID-19 crisis so far. Um, in this sense, uh, in our introduction piece, uh, we argue that uh, COVID-19 acts as a magnifying glass um, through which uh, we have been able to see the depth of multiple and intersecting inequalities so that are not just a qualification um, of uh, contemporary global capitalism, but they are right uh, at the core of how contemporary global capitalism works. And indeed, uh, what we're seeing in terms of vaccine inequality 
um, adds another layer of inequality with potentially severe long-lasting implications so that we should reflect on. So in a way, the COVID-19 crisis is an indictment uh, of uh, our economies uh, and societies. Uh, but an important question uh, is whether this crisis also represents uh, an opportunity for change. Um, so, for example, uh, we have seen how state intervention has challenged uh, imaginaries that, that were prevailing until very recently in terms of what states can do. Um, however, also here we must note uh, how the so-called uh, magic money tree has, gone, has grown uh, rapidly in some countries, uh, but not at all in others. Um, and our analysis uh, indicates uh, that the responses to the COVID-19 uh, crisis so far, uh, on the whole, do not alter pre-crisis configurations of power. And in fact, the structural divides in terms of uneven trade relations, uh, uh, the transfer of costs uh, onto the workers in the most precarious uh, occupations, uh, and uh, the global financial architecture that uh, altogether put the Global South in overall conditions of material fragility and subordination are all intact, if not exacerbated, uh, uh, at this point in time. And these are all themes uh, that are central in our special issue, as it will become clear in a moment uh, when, I pro uh, when I provide to you uh, the table of content and the key themes uh, that uh, the special issue deals with. Uh, I would also uh, like to note that an important cross-cutting theme in the special issue is that of social reproduction, and Harun mentioned the crisis of care. Um, a social reproduction lens, we believe, is necessary to both gain a more complete understanding of capitalism and also to capture the multiple inequalities that, that I have been referring to. And so the contributions uh, that uh, take uh, this lens uh, to various contexts uh, have been very important uh, to our special issue. And finally, uh, of course, as Arun was saying, an interdisciplinary lens is uh, absolutely imperative in the context of a crisis that cannot be fully understood uh, within a disciplinary silos. Uh, Richard Houghton, who is the editor of The Lancet, has defined this crisis as a syndemic rather than a pandemic, uh, to point to, to how this crisis uh, uh, is characterized, or this pandemic is characterized by both biological and social interactions. So our special issue shows how interdisciplinary engagement within the social sciences uh, uh, does offer critical perspective to understand the social, economic, and political dimensions of this uh, syndemic. Uh, and I think we should add uh, that uh, heterodox economics and uh, critical political economy are much better placed uh, to engage in this interdisciplinary dialogue across the social sciences and then mainstream economics is. So in the couple of minutes uh, that I have left, I hope, I'm going to quickly share um, my screen to show you just a few slides uh, that should give you uh, a better understanding of uh, what is included in our special issue and the different themes uh, that we touch upon and how the presentations that will follow uh, fit into this uh, overall collection. Um, so of course, uh, there is an introductory piece uh, that we have been, that I have been referring to, and uh, we have uh, uh, identified five key themes uh, that the special issue deals with. So on the first theme, the origins of the crisis in the food system and in the health uh, uh, sector and system, we have uh, four papers, um, two of which look at the food system and two of which look at uh, uh, health issues. And so the papers that you see marked with a star are those on which we're going to uh, have a presentation um, uh, following my own. Uh, on the second theme, which is the role of the state, we have three contributions that look at the role of the state from different angles and across three different contexts. Um, then we have a third theme, which is that of commodity and, of course, the reliance of many countries in the Global South on the exports of primary commodities. Where we have a, a more general paper looking at the global oil market and then two papers looking at the implications of the COVID-19 crisis on commodity uh, exporting economies in the Global South. Uh, then we have another three papers uh, on the theme of work. Uh, two of them uh, look at uh, uh, India uh, from different and complementary angles. Uh, and uh, another one looks at uh, the issue of essential work. 
And finally, the theme of global finance, uh, uh, with three contributions looking uh, at uh, debt, uh, uh, the debt crisis in low-income countries, the role of the World Bank, uh, and uh, uh, the type of institutional response that uh, we could expect uh, in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, and what kind of uh, uh, implications of this bear for um, addressing the climate crisis, which is, of course, uh, the other important crisis that we are facing. So this is where I uh, end and uh, uh, hand over back to uh, Tobias. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sarah, for this uh, very good framing of our of the different contributions and of our special issue more generally. So let me pass it on to um, the speakers that speak on the on. On this first issue that you that you, that you uh, say we identified in terms of health uh, um, and food crisis, um, and this uh, this is the contribution by uh, Camila Janella and colleagues. Um, Camila is the executive director of CISEPA uh, at the um, Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú, and Maria Jose Romero, who's a PhD candidate uh, in. Um, development economics at SOAS and their paper uh, asked why does COVID, uh, what does COVID-19 tell us about the Peruvian health system? So um, yeah, over to you, Camila and Maria Jose. Thank you. Uh, well, we are going to share a, a presentation of Maria is going to help me because my connection is so slow. <laughs> um, Well, thank you first for the opportunity to present our work. I think that you have a lot of contribution and it's, it's difficult to, to select the, the, the papers. Uh, our article is, is focused in the, in the case of Peru and, and what we were asking is uh, what, uh, what is going on on, on, on Peru, how, how to explain the, the huge impact of COVID in, the, in a country that's supposed to be in good shape before the, the pandemic. So as some of you uh, know, uh, Jose, the, this is not the, the presentation, it's like a paper what we are seeing, but I can continue. Uh, as some of you uh, know, uh, well, Peru in, in the region, in Latin America, is, is an upper middle country. Uh, it's a country that has been in constant is a stable grow, grow over the, the mean of, of the region. And uh, in, in, in terms of development indicators, uh, the, the country was in a good performance in health indicators. So on the related with the maternal health mortality, child mortality, tuberculosis, universal health care, Peru was supposedly on track. And, um, and despite of this, the country is, is one of the countries in the, in the region and in the, in the world with the highest mortality deaths related to COVID, but also with the high uh, excess uh, deaths in, this, in the 2020. So how we, we try to, to analyze what is this revealing from the Peruvian health system. Maria Jose, next. Uh, we, what we, we say is like, uh, there has been a lot of explanation when we, we speak about with public health practitioners and that and say, yeah, well, you know, there is some things that you have to understand. There is an overload on the health system. There's also the things of the political commitment. In, uh, but in Peru, you have the political committee since the beginning. It was not the situation that, that we have, in, we saw in, in Brazil or Nicaragua. We, the government say, okay, lockdown, and we were super fast on, on implementing that. Uh, uh, there is also a situation of a structural exclusion and individual characteristic. But what we said in the in the in the paper that you have to, to that is true. You have to, to see all these things, but also we need to, to understand that the how global health priorities have uh, been shaped has also have an, an impact on the on the health system. So we this understanding of health on this kind of really focused indicators 
have not shaped to strengthen the health system to make it possible to, to provide and to guarantee access to, to health care for the people. And that also explains the impact, but also the global economic policies and the, and the promotion of, for example, uh, the uh, private uh, public partnerships and how the private system has been involved on the, on the Peruvian health system has created a lot of distortions on the access to drugs, oxygen, and that also explains why people have been dying in Peru in, in, in that rate. So in the paper, we, we try to, to, to review this and to, and to, to find some explanations to, to give another understanding and to, to complement the understanding of what is going on in Peru and why we are still in this awful situation with a lot of deaths, with a still an emergency situation with some kind of lockdown in, across the country. The, the next one. So, uh, so what, what we say, as, as I say, that when we, we try to, to go deeper in the, in the global health policies, and we say, okay, and this is not new, there are other autos that has been saying this, that this is an inc increased promotion of these uh, indicators, this measurement obsession that doesn't really mean access to healthcare. And, and, and we go in the case of, of Peru with maternal, maternal deaths. And, and next ones, uh, what we know now is, for example, that Peru has uh, go back five years on maternal deaths. That's only in 2010, 2020. So that is a huge impact of, 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 the, of the current situation of the COVID. Uh, this is a situation that is not the same in all the region. It's not the same in all the in all the countries. So it's not just to understand this in terms of the uh, pressure of the of this pandemic on the health system. It just have also have to say something about how the health system has been organized to provide some just some indicators and to to show a good performance. I think I'm going to leave that and then Maria Jose can continue. Thank you, Camila, and thank you everyone, mostly the, the editors for the invitation to contribute to, to the journal. Um, I will take um, um, the presentation from, from the point that um, Camila mentioned on global health policies, also with regard to um, the the framing that the sustainable development goals um, put into countries when it comes to um, achieving the, the SDGs. And in particular, the, the SDGs also includes uh, SDG 17, that is the one that um, goes into the means of implementation of the whole set of, um, of goals, and it's the one that also promotes um, heavily the use of public-private partnerships um, for the achievement of, of the goals. And, and this promotion um, going on uh, at this point at the, at the global level translates into concrete practices at the regional and, the, and at the national level that um, has uh, proceeded with, with little regard to the underlying conditions and the cost under which um, uh, it, is, it is secure. Um, there is um, um, ambiguous evidence of, of the positive development impact of, of PPPs, as we as we will see. Um, in the case of in the case of Peru, this has been um, evident by the fact that uh, the World Bank Group, um, the Inter American Development uh, Bank, has also um, promoted the use of public private partnership for healthcare. Um, the, the promotion of PPPs um, uh, can be seen uh, in the case of Peru uh, in the implementation of two concrete uh, PPP hospitals that has been ongoing since uh, 2014, but, um, but also in the fact that there is a pipeline of, of PPP projects that um, get the attention of, of the government and of regional authorities as well. There are five uh, five PPP hospitals under negotiation, and, and most of the uh, official plans are, are focused on, on that. Um, and uh, 
the implementation of these uh, PPP uh, hospitals rests on the assumption that the state has the capacity to regulate in the public interest, which has uh, clearly been challenged by, by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And in both cases that are currently under implementation, we see that um, um, there are consortiums led by Spanish multinational companies, um, the ones that um, are implementing these, these projects. And we could clearly see from the experience of Spain and other countries in the north that this is a model uh, very uh, controversial. Um, and um, we also analyzed in our article um, how um, these um, policies are uh, being implemented um, at the global level but also at the national level intersect with some of the main features of the Peruvian health system. Um, and um, Camila will go into the details of that, but for us it was very important to um, analyze um, how a system that is highly fragmented and segmented um, uh, is the one that um, um, has the capacity to deal with a pandemic like the one that we are that we are suffering. Thank you. Over to you, Cam uh, Camila. Thanks, Camila. Camila, Maria Jose, could you uh, wrap up, please, due to yeah. time constraints? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just to, to just to cross is that as I said before, like uh, this is a. This is a table that shows that uh, we have the, the idea that before the pandemic, these regions were in good shape to provide health services and provide healthcare, and that is not the case. And in the context of Peru, and I think in, in Latin America, despite this evidence, uh, there is still a, there's not much reflection. So I think that is good to have these spaces to, to reflect on, on this. And there is no more reflection on the on the need to, to have the, the private sector involved, even in vaccines. So there's a huge discussion now on the on the vaccination that is not part of the article, but I think it's also how this has been continued. So the boost and the promotion of the private sector in the in the, in the public health is making with a lack of reflections, as Maria Jose said, lack of evidence and that. And what we see in this in in the and also there is a lot of reflection on how we are shaping the, the health system with these kind of indicators that as the Peruvian case shows, there are not enough to, pro, uh, to guarantee healthcare access to the, to the population. And I think that is what we, we can finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camila and Maria Jose. And uh, we stay in Latin America um which is um but we now go to the next theme that sara um mentioned at the beginning which is the theme of the role of the state and here we have lena lavinas who is a professor of welfare economics at the federal university in rio de janeiro and uh, also visiting leverhulm professor at soas um, and she um talks about latin america at the crossroads yet again what income policies in the post-pandemic era is, is the question that she poses in her article. Um, and let me give it over to you, Lena. Thank you. So I'd like to thank you for the introduction. Also, I'd like to thank uh, all the editors for inviting me to be part of the special issue. In special, I'd like to thank Elisa. And finally, I'd like to say that I'm pleased to be here with all of you, even though we are meeting virtually. It's great to be here. So I was asked to talk about the role of the state. It's not entirely the, the topic I have raised in my paper, but anyway, check. I suppose you can see it. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, thanks. So very quickly, as you probably all know, uh, no other region in the world has been as severely hit by the coronavirus pandemic as Latin America, according to different sources of 15 countries with the highest deaths per capita in September, 11 were uh, Latin American countries. So when the pandemic struck, Latin America was recovering from a five-year low growth uh, period 
Uh, and of course, we have been then even in a worse situation uh, after the, the pandemic outbreak, because now, according to ECLAC, we're going to have uh, economic growth rate, a negative economic growth rate by 7.7% for uh, last year. So when the pandemic uh, struck, it uh, reached a region where, which is characterized by underfunded public healthcare systems, as we have just seen in the previous presentations, access highly segmented by income, one third of uh, all uh, healthcare uh, expenses are out of pocket. We put, of course, the population always uh, uh, in risk because you don't know how much you're going to spend. And of course, this is also a dynamic that increased uh, levels of indebtedness for Latin American households. And one of the main characteristics of the region is that it has never reached universal courage, uh, coverage of social risks. And at the same time, uh, the main, uh, let's say, cash transfers, as you know, also make up uh, the bulk of social policy in Latin America. Conditional cash transfers, they become the uh, flagship, flagship uh, programs in Latin America. They have been exported as uh, a great achievement of Latin American countries. They prevailed over the 2000s as the main uh, feature of Latin American social provisions, which were uh, largely insufficient and uh, Today, one fifth of Latin Americans are uh, welfare recipients, which is pretty large. But the, the budget, the national in average, the regional GDP committed to this uh, welfare schemes is very low. It's around 0.37% of the regional GDP. And since 2013, with the end of the commodity boom, of course, we have take up rates that are falling due to cutbacks uh, in uh, social policies. So during the pandemic, we, we witnessed a huge job destruction, especially in uh, the informal sector. As you know, it's, it varies. It ranges between 50 and 80% of uh, the whole Latin American labor markets. And this uh, provoked an increase in poverty rates. So according again to ECLAC, 45.4 million people uh, fell uh, below the poverty line. They fell into poverty in the last year, which is more than one third of the population, 230 million people and 100 million uh, living in extreme poverty. So uh, what did the state do uh, in Latin America in general? Not only Latin America, if you look to the United States, to the UK, uh, not so much to France, but uh, in other countries as well. Uh, the COVID-19 policies response was mainly providing uh, unemployment and welfare direct payments in order to reduce the impact of uh, loss of income in uh, most Latin American households. So 80% of uh, all relief programs in Latin America, again, according to ECLAC, uh, consisted, consisted of expanding income transfers. Uh, but the main characteristic of these programs, like in the United States, in the UK, they were ad hoc, ad hoc programs, temporary programs. But the novelty is that they reached unprecedented scale and value. So they became much more generous towards the poor, informal workers, and the self-employed. So one of the main characteristics of these programs is that for the first time, they reach a larger uh, public, people that usually were not covered because either they were not, um, uh, they did not contribute to the formal social protection system. So they could not uh, receive unemployment benefits. On the other side, they were not poor enough to become welfare recipients. So this time they were also covered by this very, let's say, generous uh, programs. They offered higher benefits, sometimes two, three times higher than um, welfare benefits, like it's the case in Brazil. Uh, and also, but also they preserved eligibility criteria. They were being tested, but with the poverty cutoff uh, higher 
so we could cover more people because we reduced the caps that maintained the poverty threshold, threshold very low in our countries. But the other novelty also is that most of the time uh, uh, we waive conditionalities. And this is also a characteristic that is being uh, generalized in most conditional cash, trans in cash transfers worldwide, which are not really now uh, a characterized market by conditionalities. So there are two countries uh, from which I can speak a bit more, Argentina and Brazil, same model, emergency cash transfers. Brazil has adopted uh, Auxilio Emergencial, which is what we have called an emergency basic income program, uh, $120 per month for uh, five months. And then we, ha we have the benefit and uh, it, uh, it, was, it came down to $60 per month to 67.2 million people. And we doubled the benefit value to loan mothers, poor loan mothers. So for the first time, welfare recipients in Brazil, especially loan mothers, poor loan mothers, they received six times the value of a uh, welfare benefit in Brazil. So it was really, there was a huge impact in Argentina, we had the same with the Ingresso Familiar de Emergencia, which reached 11 million recipients, also with a fixed value benefit of $100. And we, they also increased, they also offered uh, an extraordinary bonus uh, to uh, 20 million uh, families, 20 million people that were already uh, recipients of the Asignación Universal Política. So what are the preliminary findings? And uh, I will wrap up here. So of course, because uh, those emergency cash transfers were very generous with uh, uh, values that uh, either topped or even exceeded uh, average uh, benefits, uh, either contributory or non-contributory in Latin America, we could reduce the impact of the coronavirus uh, crisis and the increase in the Gini index will be mu much lower around 2.9% in average instead of 5.6% uh, like ECLAC expected last year with their uh, uh, preliminary estimates. But of course, in the second year of uh, COVID-19, those ad hoc measures are either being scaled down or suppressed, and uh, welfare benefits are again returning to their pre-pandemic levels. <clears throat> Poverty thresholds have not been uh, revalued, so they are again uh, uh, remain the same as uh, uh, prior to the pandemic, which means that we're going to really maintain the cap very low and unemployment benefits also were not redesigned to improve their coverage. So uh, as we know, because of our level of informality, most workers in Latin America, uh, they are not eligible for unemployment benefits. And of course, there was a huge flood of cash that instead of reinforcing welfare institutions, which remain incomplete, weak, uh, underfunded, what we have done was uh, to uh, transfer cash to uh, a huge number of families, which was of course important, but it doesn't really address our structural problems in terms of improving social protection systems in Latin America. So why did this happen? I have some assumptions. One is, is this a way of preventing post-crisis trajectories from reinforcing social and economic rights, making it easier to impose new rounds of austerity once the worst of the uh, COVID-19 crisis is passed. So this is my, my feeling. My feeling is that we need, instead of focusing on improving uh, and addressing our structural uh, problems and uh, reinforce uh, the institutions, our welfare institutions that remain, that continue to exist that had suffered from underfinancing, what the states preferred to do was to choose this path, which is a parallel path, uh, uh, implement um, temporary ad hoc programs. And then in the end, when it's finished, you just go back, you just return to normalcy 
And of course, uh, I think that we won't uh, see a move uh, in terms of restoring ill-equipped Ill -equipped public healthcare systems. We'll continue to see a mishandling in the vaccine rollout, but not only, and in the end, we won't see a revamp of social policies to make them much more uh, effective and contribute, making them contribute to really reduce those deep inequalities we have in Latin America. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Lena. And very interesting, um, especially the point regarding the ineffectiveness of any kind of cash transfer if uh, there remains an underfunded health and social system in um, as part of the responsibilities of the state. So into, on to the next uh, block. And um, as uh, you know, Sada also mentioned, this crisis as a uh, simultaneously demand and supply crisis has had severe impacts, especially on commodity prices and with a lot of countries in the global south, depending on the export on com um, of commodities that has particularly affected those countries that uh, do uh, extract and export commodities. So um, on to the next block um, where Nana Ama uh, Asante Poku uh, and uh, so Sophie van Hullen um, write a paper or wrote a paper about these vulnerabilities uh, of commodity exporters in the times of COVID-19 and um, analyze the case of Ghana. Uh, Nana will present, uh, Manana is a research fellow at the Institute of Statistical and Social Economic Research at the University of Ghana. Hello, good evening everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to have this presentation. And so as um, has already been introduced, I will be talking on the topic of commodity exporters vulnerabilities in times of COVID-19. and. We're looking at the case of Ghana. Um, so the outline for this presentation, I'll just do an introduction, tell you the research question methodology, give you Ghana's experience, implications, recommendations, and a conclusion. So um, COVID-19 has been a health crisis, um, health and economic crisis for all economies, but especially for commodity dependent economies, it's been an economic crisis. Um, these commodity uh, dependent uh, economies actually generate over 80% of their revenues from commodities. And in the case of Ghana, three commodities, gold, cocoa, and oil, make up over 80% of its revenue. Ghana is the second largest producer of cocoa in the world, and it's Africa's largest gold exporter. What happens is that these revenues are a great source of um, finance for states and governments to carry out their development objectives. And um, commodity dependent economies are not, they are not new to global crisis, um, but then the COVID-19 crisis is unique in, in the sense that it is both a, a simultaneous demand and supply shock, and then the size and the speed of the demand shock has been unprecedented. So we, um, we built on three channels that UNSAC had identified as um, being the channels through which commodity dependent economies are affected. Um, the price channel, a supply chain channel, and then a, finance, a financial channel. Um, the price channel basically refers to drastic declines in commodity prices, the supply chain channel refers to disruptions in global supply chains um, and then the financial channel refers to the activities of, um, fi uh, of financial investors and also um, so that financial investors resulting in uh, pro-cyclical capital flows and debt servicing costs. What you realize is that um, the commodity price is one of, is one of the key or the most significant channels through which the COVID-19 crisis impacts the commodity dependent uh, economies. Um, commodity prices are determined by de demand and supply changes and there's been drastic demand changes um, affecting these three commodities that I just mentioned, gold, um, cocoa and oil. And also the, we have financial investors who are in the commodity market and they their actions may actually um, increase the volatility of price price changes in the market. What we have is that 
these changes um, then have implications for the revenue streams. Um, it has implications for the physical uh, space. It has implications for debt servicing, for foreign exchange. It, it basically has implications for the macroeconomic stability of the country. Um, so for the three commodities I'm talking about, I'll just give you a few a few um, um, highlights of what has happened in those markets during the COVID-19 situation. And this is, as um, was mentioned earlier, this was done in the early in the early days of the uh, pandemic. So um, much of this was up to like September, October 2020. Um, we had um, oil having a drastic um, decline in prices. Um, also a decline in um, in demand, basically because people uh, travel uh, was halted. Um, people were working from home. Lockdowns had people working from home. Um, so the the strategies used by countries to mitigate the 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 or or to curb the spread of COVID nineteen actually resulted in some demand and supply um, shocks to to commodities. Um, for gold, uh, cocoa we had a decline in demand. Um, gold, uh, cocoa is a luxury is a luxury um, product uh, at the end of the day because it's used to produce chocolate and chocolate is a, a, a luxury product and chocolate um, much much of chocolate is um, uh, eaten or, or produced and eaten in in the western in the western hemisphere in the western world. Um, Europe has um, a large um, uh, a large amount of um, demand for cocoa, for chocolate and that's where uh, cocoa is used to produce chocolate uh, we had a large decline in the price um, there is a possibility of a continued decline in the price of cocoa as um, grinding falls in the eu and then for gold 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 had a good a good run during the covid 19 um, crisis gold is a as a store of wealth, so most people um, went and bought gold. So there was increase in gold prices, there was increase in the demand for gold, but at the same time there was a decline in jewelry demand. So that kind of um, stabilized had an effect on on how high the demand went. So for our research question, we were looking at how resilient um, Ghana's revenue and physical space is. Um, with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic. And pre-COVID-19, the global situation was that there was, um, global trade was already declining. Commodity prices were already low. For the national situation, we already had increase in government debt, um, exchange rate depreciation, and then increase in non-concessional borrowing. Ghana is now a, middle a lower middle income country, so access to concessional uh, loans are, uh, are limited or restricted. So, we, we looked at a, and we, we adapted a methodology. Um, since um, commodity prices is one of the mis, uh, most significant, uh, significant ways through which um, the, the impact of COVID-19 is transmitted onto, onto commodity dependent countries, we adapted um, supply chain analysis and a commodity price analysis. But then what we did then was to uh, put together um, look at the supply chain in terms of a complex adaptive system and what we what we mean by that is that um, in the in the in the supply chain there are different actors there are governments there are multinational um, companies there are financial investors there are even the cocoa farmers and um, each one of these um, stakeholders have their own um, mechanisms for for dealing with with, with the effects of the crisis. But at the same time, they need each other. So even though they have uh, their symmetries in how best they can deal with the impact of COVID-19, they all do need to work together. And the resilience of one actor uh, may impede the resilience of the other, or at the same time, the resilience of one may actually bring up the resilience of the other. Um, what we did, we, we did, um, because it was a this was in the beginning, at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, we looked at the short-term impact. Um, so we just looked at the, uh, the impact of the crisis 
on the Ghanaian state and, and, and its interactions with the other actors, we didn't go um, lower down the chain. So Ghana's experience um, for supply, we realized that there was, there was no disruption in, 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 in the production of gold, cocoa, or um, oil. Production went on as usual. And this is because um, the areas in which um, gold, oil, and um, oil are actually produced were not hard hit um, by, by COVID-19. Actually, Ghana, relatively, was not hard hit by um, COVID-19. Um, and we had just three three weeks of lockdown. So, and these uh, producing areas were not necessarily in the areas that were under lockdown. So production weren't on as usual. But then what you realized was that there were disruptions in services and in input uh, provision. So there were uh, disruptions in cocoa spraying and in um, fertilizer programs. And then also um, the amount of um, cocoa that was exported, uh, that was taken to the ports was lower in comparison with 2019. And then um, oh, um, as time goes on, um, it is expected that continued lower prices would have an impact uh, on future investments for these, for these commodities. Specific to Ghana, the implications of both the uh, a combination of the national or the domestic situation and what was happening at the international level meant that Ghana had a decreased access to foreign exchange. Um, Ghana uses what is called the COCO syndicate loan to acquire funding for some of its um, development pro uh, programs. And this is like a, this is a 1.3 billion loan. What Ghana does is it sells forward um, about 70% of its ex uh, uh, predicted crop, cocoa pro, uh, crop, and then uses this money to finance um, its needs. And what we had was that international lenders were hesitant to underwrite this 1.3 billion loan. Um, and as a result of that, uh, of that um, local farmers were, were, there were delays in having paying farmers. Finally, Ghana did secure, um, um, did secure the loan using a combination of international and local banks. Um, and so was able to go ahead um, and get some funding. But also we realized that as a result of the crisis, there's been an increase in government debt. And it's two ways, because government has had to borrow to finance um, its, 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 its expenditures. And at the, same, at the same time, the revenue that it's receiving is, is lower. And then there's also been a decreased access to credit. Um, could, could I please uh, ask you to wrap up? Um, okay. Um, decreased access to credit. And then lastly, there's also been a restricted fiscal space. Um, the, uh, Ghana has had to withdraw some money from its sovereign wealth funds. And then it also now has an increased debt servicing because one, because it's, its credit ratings has gone down. And this then means that there's a reduced ability to invest for future economic growth. And so what the country would have to do is to consider um, diversifying its economy in the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, sorry for rushing you a little bit, but we have two more uh, presentations to come. Uh, we move now to uh, the um, the theme related to work, um, and here uh, Surbi and uh, Surbi Kesar and colleagues wrote about the impact of COVID-19 uh, on livelihoods in India. Um, Surbi is an assistant professor in economics at the School of Arts and Sciences at Asim Premji University in uh, Bengaluru, um, and yeah, she will present on behalf of her and her colleagues. Thanks a lot, Tobias, and all the editors for the special issue. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the paper Pandemic Informality and Vulnerability Impact of COVID-19 on Livelihoods in India. It is a co-authored work uh, with uh, Rosa Abraham, who is on the Zoom um, uh, meeting today, uh, Rahul Lahoti, Amit Basoli, and Paratoshnath. And as with all other works, 
a team of researchers and of course the respondents who responded to our survey. So let me begin by basically pointing out that Indian economy has experienced high economic growth for nearly three decades. However, despite that, a vast majority of its working population derives livelihoods from the informal economy. Now this persistence of informality, of course, have been studied in various mainstream as well as heterodox strands. But one common feature in all these strands has been this expectation of a transformation and a capitalist transition with growth. A recent strand of literature following Kalyan Sanal characterizing the post-colonial uh, development process or rather the post-colonial capitalism talks about that the process of growth uh, in these economies is in fact exclusionary in nature, where informality is not due to a lack of growth, but rather is an outcome of it. And I will come back to this towards the end of my presentation. Now in India, even as agriculture shed labor, the high productivity formal sector has failed to create jobs in keeping with this increased labor supply. Further, there has been an increase in formalization and precaritization of jobs even within the formal sector, thereby you know, contributing to the overall high levels of informality of the Indian workforce. Informal employment, as we know, is marked by low earnings, precarious working conditions, weak or absent social protection, and at the extreme a dependence on day-to-day -day earnings for sustenance. Now, it has been widely documented in the literature and what uh, you know, you've been talking about in terms of uh, this special issue that the impact of pandemic has mostly been along the lines of some pre-existing vulnerability. The informal economy in the Indian context represents the crucial site of these economic vulnerability. In fact, not just economic, but rather also an overlap with various social vulnerabilities as well. Now for such a large country in the presence of such high informality with insecure jobs and absence of longer term contracts, when the economic activities are disrupted due to an economic lockdown, when the pandemic spread to India, which was one of the most stringent lockdowns in the world, with a four hours notice, by the way, it isn't really unexpected that there would be a large scale loss of jobs and earnings. In addition, given that there's a lack of, or rather, I mean, there's a lack of adequate social security measures, this loss soon, in fact, translated into livelihood insecurity and hunger and indebtedness. Well, the impact of pandemic is not entirely unexpected, but what this forces us is to think about the nature of development trajectory, which despite you know, of being associated with high economic growth has not translated into secure jobs for a vast majority of the population. With these broad structural vulnerabilities in mind, in order to evaluate this impact, we conducted a phone survey in the middle of the pandemic of around 5,000 workers, to whom we are eternally grateful for giving us the time, especially during such a hard uh, you know, time that they were going through. And these were workers belonging mainly to vulnerable households with income a little below or equivalent to the median income of the country and working mainly in informal works across 12 states in India. And for this, we collaborated with civil society organizations who were closely engaged with these workers. Now, a broad snapshot of the results, and of course, in the paper, we've detailed this out, but I just want to give some key findings here. What we find is that around two thirds of the workforce in our sample lost employment during the lockdown, with the impact being much more severe in the urban areas. Now, if we exclude the farmers out, uh, three fourths of you know, workers suffered a loss in employment. Those who were self-employed in agriculture were in fact the least, least impacted because you know, they, there's, there's not really a concept of losing employment so much when you're working in agriculture because you're tilling your own piece of land. The urban self-employed were the worst impacted with nearly 90% of the respondents in our sample losing employment. Uh, agriculture self-employment in many ways happened to be a fallback option for the retrenched workers. Women were slightly more impacted than men in terms of loss in employment. Muslims, which is a minority in the country, were again slightly more uh, likely to lose jobs than Hindus. There was in fact not much caste-based difference. Caste is a social, I mean, caste of Indian economy is socially, uh, you know, it is, is aligned in a social hierarchy along the caste lines. But the difference that we're not seeing, at least in the caste uh, lines, is probably because of, you know, some distress driven sort of work that they were forced to do or an over representation in certain essential services. Uh, other than that, you know, as expected, health and education sector were in fact uh, less impacted um, relative to other sectors of the economy. 
But along with this, what really happened was that there was a translation of this loss in employment expectedly to earning loss. And across employment types and social identities, earnings fell by an enormous margin of 40 to 50%. In fact, even the regular salaried work, which is supposedly more secure, 48% of the regular salaried workers reported not having received any salary or reduced salary during the lockdown period. And mind you, the lockdown in India lasted for a little over 60 days. Although 60% of respondents in agriculture and allied sectors had some produce to sell, but an overwhelming majority of it could not sell uh, any of their harvest. Now, overall, you know, it's, it's, we see this sort of impact across different employment categories for men, women, though there's some difference. But what really seems to be happening is that even for the relatively more secure jobs, given the you know, extent of precarity in the workforce, there seems to be an impact which is across the board. The crisis seems to have acted along the fault lines of informality and has an effect of leveling down of livelihoods across the board for this vulnerable population. This, as expected, in the absence of social security nets, soon translated into, uh, you know, uh, various livelihood insecurities. Uh, for example, 80% of our uh, respondents from, house, uh, from different households said that uh, they were consuming less food than before. Around 47% uh, people said that they did not have in, even enough money to buy a week's worth of essential. 36% took loans to cover their expenses during the lockdown. And of the people staying on rented accommodation, 85% said they did not have enough money to buy, uh, to, to even pay the next month's rent. And, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, the, this insecurity was a little less for, especially the food insecurity for farmer households. But given that so many proportion of population had to reduce their food intake, we can imagine the mammoth amount of uh, you know, uh, uh, what this really entails. Now, coming to the last part of the discussion, I'll just take a couple uh, more minutes where, where the idea is that there's, there's two characteristic features of the Indian economy, the predominantly informal nature and the critically low investment in social uh, state-funded social security nets, which appear to have played an important role to produce such an acute impact. Now, the informal nature of job absolves the labor, uh, the employer of any legal responsibility. But of course, if the state steps in, the amount of impact uh, this would have could to some extent be mitigated. But in India, not only was this uh, state support really uh, thin, in fact, one of the uh, uh, programs that worked best was in-kind support of food. But despite that, there was a huge food insecurity that we just talked about. Uh, for almost half of the vulnerable population reported not having received any cash transferred, which snowballed into this mammoth impact that we are talking about. Now, lockdown is lifted, people are coming back, and there's some recovery in the economy that we are seeing. But what, you know, another, some of our other ongoing works, uh, what we're showing is that there's this huge move towards informality even more than what it existed earlier. In, in that context, you know, one could think about these policy measures, for example, better social security measures, which is provided by the state, scaling up of enterprises in order to improve formalization, enforcing labor law so that they better collective bargaining mechanisms, even if the labor market is not very tight. However, we are dealing with a bigger question here. The scale of this COVID crisis is presenting this radical opportunity to rethink the current development trajectory. And it's radical in two ways. On, on one hand, one is asking about whether there's a possibility of the Indian economy to undergo a successful structural transformation under the current growth process, which, as I was talking about, Sanyal's analysis in the recent uh, you know, period talks about that this, this sort of informality is an outcome of the growth process, where the ongoing growth process transfers resources from subsistence-driven traditional segments to the uh, modern uh, you know, growth-driven sector, where the population in these traditional segments is not absorbed in the modern formal sector. Now, this excluded population is then forced to reproduce its conditions of livelihood in the informal economy. Therefore, it raises questions about the possibility of the current development and growth trajectory delivering a transformation. But on the other hand, the last point that I want to make is that even if such a transformation were possible, given the proliferation of informality, even in the most advanced and the developed economies of the world, the conjuncture also posits the need to critically reassess the limits of an already transformed economy or an ordered economy already undergone a transition to provide secure employment to its population under the current trajectory of global capitalism. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Sorbi. Um, and now for our last presentation, we have Christina Lascarides. Christina is a lecturer in economics at the Open University uh, here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and she uh, and her contribution uh, talks about COVID-19 and the debt crisis in low and middle income countries um, as this current crisis, of course, has um, large uh, ramifications for uh, countries um, and their debt issues. Um, so, Christina. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Great. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Just give me one second. Um, so hopefully you can see that screen okay? Yes? Okay, great. So I first want to thank um, everybody for putting this amazing event on and for pulling this together. Uh, it's a real honor to be part of this special issue and also to be part of the launch. So thank you very, very much. Um, I want to introduce some key elements uh, in my paper uh, called When Push Came to Shove. COVID-19 and debt crises in low-income countries. And I just want to start by pointing out two big um, sort of background points um, that the paper builds on. One big important background point, maybe pre-pandemic point, uh, is the fact that the concerns for the potential of a debt crisis has been growing and mounting in recent years. And it's precipitated a very big discussion on a looming debt crisis, on new debt traps, on growing vulnerabilities. And that discussion has really picked up speed since 2015, 2016 onwards by key institutions, um, such as uh, many UNCTAD's been put, put, um, picking this up, uh, but also the IMF, and it's generated a lot of sort of scholarship. So um, the idea of a debt crisis coming has been sort of coming up the agenda for quite some time now. And why have this, how, why has this been, uh, you know, what, what's behind this? There are several explanations. One that I just want to mention here is, uh, it is very much about global inequalities and unequal financial integration to the global economy um, that exposes countries to different types of dynamics. Um, one that I've worked on with co-authors as well is this surge of global liquidity that uh, is out of countries' control but drives debt dynamics, in particular the cost of borrowing and ability to refinance. And that whole story is linked to the U.S. monetary policy, um, the sort of global search for yield, and the and the kind of outcome of that is the change in creditor landscape and increase of private sector participants in um, low-income country borrowing. Um, so second big background point is, well, what happens, what do we know about what happens when debt crises happen is uh, when countries find themselves in debt repayment difficulties, we know um, that they face an amalgam of creditor led forums, disparate legal environments, they are litigated against in Western countries courts. They're forced to abandon development plans alongside contractionary IMF programs that are largely acknowledged as failing to restore um, sort of growth, equitable growth, or even restore the debt problems. Um, and that's led to this whole too little, too late approach uh, at great social cost to the debtor country. So that's very well established from, you know, maybe several decades of crises that we've seen. So that sort of grounds the push bit of the paper and then Come COVID, I sort of look at the shove and how the um, how COVID has sort of precipitated a lot of these growing dynamics um, and accelerated the pace of these difficulties. So the, the, there has been a growing number of default sovereign downgrades and the kind of largest capital outflow reversal ever recorded, which has somewhat been restored, but. Um, the, the, the paper tries to map a little bit of the global policy response to the debt issues, mainly by the two institutions that have led that response, so the IMF and the G20. Um, and just some characteristics of that response is the IMF's focused mainly on increasing access to expensive loans. Uh, a lot of the loans um, have gone to countries that are already in a very um, sort of precarious debt situation. Um, 
and even to the countries that are eligible for the second sort of pillar of the response, which is the G20, the G20's program. Um, the G20 program is sort of eligible for low income and least developed countries, and it provides a sort of breathing space. Um, but the breathing space is very partial. It's only on a certain portion of a country's external debt, so that they're owed to bilateral creditors, and it postpones the payments. So there's no creditor loss and there's no real relief that's just due in a little bit further down the line. So the I, I kind of look at how, uh, what's the characteristic of the response to countries that are DSSA are eligible, but have also received IMF emergency financing. Um, so there's a bit of empirical um, work on that. And uh, the overarching point from that is that um, the, the, the response is very limited. Um, the sizes are negligible, the, the, um, and in terms of loans, and in terms of uh, the grant fin financing, especially. Um, the DSSI, even if implemented in full, doesn't cover um, half the payments due in 2020. And it exacerbates this sort of aforementioned point about um, the fact that non-participating non creditors, um, their repayment gets eased through the setup because uh, the IMF is, anyway. And so I just uh, map that and then go on to some of the global discussion that came out um, since March on the global debt issue. And I try and organize the, the response to the debt issues and I've sort of as, as listed over here. Um, so the, the discussion that's really come out of the pandemic really focuses on how to get the private sector involved, how to um, create legislation that can protect debtors from litigation. There's been a whole host of market-based solutions um, that sort of advocated as possible solutions to the crisis. Uh, but there has been also calls for much greater creditor coordination. Um, and despite the efforts to suggest that there isn't sort of enough political dynamic for cancellation or uh, sort of institutional approaches. And um, there has been a very broad, wide ranging campaign, not just in civil society, but also in parliamentarians to push for the needed cancellation and to in sort of advocate for a kind of institutional approach. Um, so the, the paper picks up on one aspect of these critiques in particular, which is really about the perils of loan approval processes at the IMF. And I focus on one aspect of this critique to highlight how the DSA, the debt sustainability analysis of the IMF and the World Bank sort of exacerbates these inequalities. So I analyzed 40 of the, uh, approximately 40 of the loan approval documents that had come out um, in the first six months to just try and understand what, on what basis were, they, were these loans made and sort of on what was the basis of this policy response. So on the left-hand side panel, um, the over, we, we basically have the projected real GDP growth that underpins the loan approval process. And um, they're all predicated on a very sharp V-shaped recovery with average growth of 2021, slightly higher than previous to the pandemic. Um, and on the right-hand side, um, we have the projected primary deficit underpinning the loan programs, which are heavily predicated on a one year of sort of increased deficit spending and consolidation over the following years. So I try and unpick some of the problems that are involved here. And um, I basically suggest that the DSAs don't actually provide an adequate assessment of countries' ability to repay. Um, and one of the sort of some of the drivers of debt dynamics uh, in the DSA are, of course, the future growth rates, the rate of in future growth rates, future rates of interest, primary balances are the key sort of things that are highlighted in this um, sort of faulty framework. And um, one of the things that's really striking is that um, the things that the, the interaction of these policies has really not been taken into account at all. Um, not only is the future generally in, in the level of uncertainty is unprecedented and not only is the future impossible to kind of project, but in this context as well, um, how are assessments being made when it's so unclear what financing will be available and on what terms, when you have the interaction of these, the big increase of private sector borrowing being due over the next few years and the COVID, IMF COVID loans being due over the next few years and the DSSI um, repayments the postponements being due over the next few years. 
Um, likewise, with the future, with this predicted growth path, um, these unrealistic growth assumptions that we know the IMF is very famous for, um, not only is the impact still unraveling, um, but there is sort of numerous, there is a lot of evidence that the, um, the actual performance uh, of growth in a deep crisis is dramatically worse than the IMF's projections. So it's kind of laughable. Um, the same with the assumption of austerity. So from all of these very recent um, crises, we know that austerity worsen, worsens growth prospects and has devastating impacts on health inequality, poverty, and a bad track record of um, resolving debt repayment problems. Um, there has been a call for stimulus uh, across these institutions, uh, but that's been met by um, sort of underlying policies and, and assumptions uh, that they will consolidate. So uh, reading the, the loan approval documents, you see that non-priority, what's called non-priority infrastructural spending has already been identified to be curtailed. So um, countries are getting an undue label of sustainability when development programs are already being curtailed in order to suit that framework. So that's one point. The second, the other point about this is that this emergency loan financing is finite. And once those access limits are reached, then countries have to migrate to um, upper credit tranche programs. So high conditionality programs, which we know are also lots of evidence past work that's been done to show that those are responsible for a lot of the underfunded healthcare um, uh, systems that you know, ostensibly these programs are trying to sort of bolster. So uh, the kind of final point and kind of conclusion of the paper is to try and highlight that these points to problems that are beyond the difficulties of making future projections. And that's really about the DSA uh, as an inappropriate, as being inappropriate by construction. Um, partly because it's a creditor, it's a creditor created tool um, created to suit internal decision making needs. And um, so rather, so besides highlighting some of the overarching problems of the IMF and uh, G20 response, my, I, I want to highlight that um, this DSA, this loan approval process is part of the structural problem that was mentioned at the beginning. Uh, because it enables sustainability labels to be applied unduly. And that, in, as a consequence, is to underestimate the severity of a debt crisis and then to undermine the needed relief. Um, so coupled with this very unequal creditor-led system, um, the, uh, the, 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 the problems get exacerbated. So as part of those um, kind of calls for for cancellation, for the net financing needs that are uh, new, the financing that's needed and the debt relief needs have been calculated. Uh, UNCTAD has been again, sort of uh, highlighting a lot of these issues. Um, is the need to bring to the fore uh, a series of alternatives, which again, have a very long history going back decades, which bring to the kind of core of assessments, either human rights framework, development centered approach um, so the idea of including SDG financing as part of expenditures that would use that would be uh, used to assess um, the needed debt reductions, uh, as well as integrating um, soft law principles for how to resolve debt crises as part of DSAs. Um, these are all alternatives that would bring uh, basically be independent from creditors and bring fairer uh, alternatives that need to be be bigger part of the conversation. So um, I hope I haven't overrun time too much, but that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina, um, for this enlightening presentation. And thank everybody, um, all of the presenters as well. Uh, there hasn't been many uh, questions in the chat and also due to time constraints, uh, rather than doing a Q and A, uh, we, unfortunately have to wrap up. I could, uh, of course, engage in a discussion with all of you for much longer, but we have also some time constraints. Uh, and then I just wanted to ask Sara um, to wrap up to sort of bring things together. Um, and um, yeah, and bring things to a conclusion as well. Uh, thank you so much, Tobias. Uh, um, I will try to do so. And in fact, I will try 
perhaps uh, to end on a more optimistic note, because I'm aware that in my initial framing, I have provided quite a gloomy picture. And of course, we need to be aware of uh, the gloomy picture, but I think uh, we need to think in more optimistic terms, in terms of uh, where we go from here. Um, so I think what uh, we know is that so the system that we've had so far uh, has produced a number of outcomes uh, that are not working uh, for the majority. Um, so we know that uh, we cannot just go back to the old status quo. Something needs to change. And uh, our analysis, uh, in particular, uh, the analysis of all of the presenters, uh, uh, show that uh, we are able to identify where the problems are. So starting from uh, uh, issues of uh, health inequalities, uh, which uh, of course are underpinned by socioeconomic inequalities, uh, uh, how cash transfers uh, alone uh, cannot be a solution and we need uh, to have long-term patients uh, and especially we need to push back against uh, any potential return of austerity measures. Uh. Um, the need for commodity exporting countries uh, to uh, diversify their productive capacity and their productive base, uh, as uh, Nana was suggesting. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the importance of uh, focusing on job creation and the creation of good quality jobs uh, and not only on economic growth uh, that is driven by uh, exports and extraction of natural resources, uh, but the importance of ensuring uh, decent livelihoods uh, to people. Um, alongside uh, the importance of uh, the valorization of care and social reproduction, which we have been mentioning as a cross-cutting theme. And finally, um, also the need for institutional change uh, to address uh, the debt crisis uh, that so many countries uh, uh, will be facing in different ways. Um, so I think uh, this is no easy task. Uh, but I think uh, where we uh, need to go from here is to work collectively uh, towards uh, the formulation of uh, alternatives uh, along the lines uh, that we have discussed to address the problems uh, that we can see very clearly. So I think I will end here. Thank you so much. Ah, and uh, sorry, let me just uh, thank again uh, all of the presenters uh, and clearly uh, the future is in the hands of women as our panel has demonstrated. Uh, so it was great and thank you so much all for your contributions and particularly also the contributors who are in the background but who are here with us. Um, we really appreciate uh, your support and your work and thank you to all of the audience as well. But Toby, you can uh, close this. Yeah, no, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't have wrapped it up better than you. That was perfect to bring everything together. Uh, thank you very much, Sara. And again, also from my side on behalf of everybody, of Lisa and, uh, and Yanis, of course, as well. Thanks everybody for co contributing to it. Thank you everybody for uh, listening in today. Um, as I said before, if you want to get a copy of uh, the special issue, please fill in the, in the Google form that I sent around at the beginning. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody. Um, um, we have a last uh, webinar in our webinar series um, for this term coming up in two weeks. So on the 24th of March, as well, um, again, at 5 p.m., we have um, sort of continuing the theme of social reproduction, um, a panel on social reproduction, financial exclusion, and alternatives. So please have a look at the SOAS Economic, uh, Department of Economics website, where um, uh, details can be found on that. And it's, again, hosted on Zoom at 5 p.m. on the 24th of March. So please join us then as well. Um, and uh, in the meantime, have a great rest of your evening, a great rest of your week, and uh, thank you to, from the Department of Economics for joining us today.